the head of the modeling agency uh, wanted to make a band, like a boy band. Like, uh, 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 if you can Google it, by the way, like we were uh, kind of known throughout the lands of Panama. You were in a fucking boy band? What the fuck is going on right now, dude? <laughs> and it was organized by the modeling agency head, right? And he just picked- <laughs> Okay, hold on, he let's put- <laughs> <laughs> so you went to go you went to go be a fucking model, right? Yeah. You go and you take their pictures, they go, listen, this is not gonna work. In five, four, three, two, one. What's up, everybody? Welcome to another episode of the Genius Brain Podcast. I'm your host, David So, and today on Artist Spotlight. Now it's not a section I said. But... <laughs> so recently uh on this podcast, I've been, you know, kind of on the hunt looking for new artists to kind of highlight. So before you, I had somebody named Jason Chenny. It was a super funny stand-up comic that kind of came through here. And this is like a lot of people on the space that I don't think people know of as much as other people, right? And I know this sounds a little weird, but for me personally, I'm a very spiteful human being. So there's just a lot of really terrible people. And not, not in terms of like personality, but in terms of their talent. They really fucking mm-hmm. suck. And so my 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 thing is like, okay, since I have a platform, I'm gonna find new people mm-hmm. and then bring them on this podcast and kind of give them a lot of spotlight. So for yeah. you. I, I found you through the most just just IGTV. I don't know I don't know who posted you, really? but somebody posted you doing uh, a, a version of Willy Wonka's True Imagination. True Imagination yeah. on on the on the guitar, and you yeah. play. So if for people who don't know who this is, this is Ruben Juan. Last name is Juan. W A N. Yes. Okay, Ruben Juan, and um, yeah, I found you through Instagram, and it it kind of blew me away. I was like, who the fuck is this guy, right? And you look super fucking young. Um, so, welcome to the podcast. I'm actually 56. <laughs> um, thank you very much for inviting me. It's super random. I've been a fan since I was like 17. Oh, that's crazy. I'm actually 26. So, oh, really? Yeah, I'm 26. Do you look 17 right now, dude? <laughs> <laughs> that's fucking random. I've been in LA for eight years. That's um, crazy. But I follow you since I was in Panama already. Really? Like, actually, we would, I would sit with all my cousins, my sister, with like six people would just watch. Uh, first, like through JK News, and we would see like the um, the interactions there, and then by myself, I would just like go through your YouTube and search for most popular and watch all the uh, Kunyang He and like the how fucking you know what's so random uh, about that in too? Panama, by the way, this is Central America. Yeah, that's it's so not like crazy. I'm in LA. Like I discovered you through a friend. Like it's just I'm in this tiny little town in Panama with all my Asian cousins, just watching JK News, and then by myself, I would just like. Nerd That's out so on your stuff. Fucking crazy. That blows my mind. Yeah. Because I forget that when we create these videos, it goes outside of Los Angeles. You know, because when we create these videos, we're not really. Th- I'm. I mean, I, I think me and JK are are a little different in the sense of that we didn't. I think we just created just because we liked to. Yeah, yeah. Right. That wasn't an objective of get, garnering millions and millions of views. Mm-hmm. It was just okay. I think this is funny, and I want to do this. Let me see if people enjoy it or if they if they enjoy what we talk about. And it just it's kind of weird because the, the person before here, Jason, he also watched me when mm. he was uh, younger as well too. Yeah, yeah. And it, it's just very odd, like because I don't I don't think about what happens when I create the video and who it affects. Right. Yeah. We just we just kind of create stupid shit and we yeah. talk about dumb stuff yeah. and then we see what happens. Yeah. How fucking insane! Even on a personal level, like it's not like a ten year gap like me with you, mm-hmm. but I get. Uh, like with a five years gap because I've been creating for the past eight years since I've been in LA, right? Yeah. So I have fans that have been following me for five or six years and they come up to me and they start singing a song that I wrote five, six years ago. How I'm random. like, wow. Like, how, first of all, how do you find this random video I did six years ago? Mm-hmm. And two, you actually took your time to learn the lyrics and learn the actual melody to my song. Yeah. And then you have the balls, like the... Like the chorus should come up to me, say hi, and then start singing it right away. <laughs> yeah, yeah, and I'm yeah, just yeah. like, wow, thank you so much. Yeah. yeah. How did you start getting into music? Like Into music? Yeah. Um, specifically playing the guitar. Oh, uh, specifically guitar. Uh, I've told this story a million times. Uh, I was probably 15 years old. So 10 years ago, like around 10 years ago. And I was uh, in high school at that time. It was probably, I think me- between middle school and high school, right? And I just wanted to pick up a, a new skill set. Yeah. And I was very bored, summer vacations. I tell my mom, mom, uh, there's this guitar course at uh, my current high school. Like, can I enroll and like do this summer course thingy? She's like, sure, why not? And I'm like, oh, cool. And then mm-hmm. she bought me my first acoustic guitar. And from there on, I just practice and practice. I learned four chords in three months. It mm-hmm. took me three months to learn my first four chords. 
why the fuck did it take you so long? Because <laughs> I only had one teacher in the school, right? Okay. And then <laughs> I was like, four quarters. And he, God damn, dude. And he was uh, a painter. He yeah. was an art teacher that knew a couple guitar chords, right? Yeah. And the duration of a course was three months, right? And every single day, he would be like, here's the four chords. And here are all these songs that you can play with the four chords. And he would just tell me to shed those. And for some reason, like my 15-year-old self, I was so um, enamored or just like so passionate about just even though my fingers hurt like crazy, I would just sit outside of the classroom, even after the class, because we only had like one hour class. I would just stay there four hours just trying to nail these four chords. For the whole two, three months, I was there just nailing these four chords. And that's how I fell in love with the guitar. But the true reason was to pick up girls. Of course, that's how it always is, dude. <laughs> Why the, why the fuck else would anybody pick up a fucking instrument? But the problem with that is uh, I was pretty, I was way chunkier back then. and But it still <laughs> fucking works. <laughs> it always works. And girls were impressed by the skill, but they weren't in love with it, you know? Mm -hmm. uh, and that's how I... Should like, play the guitar with your penis. That would have been different. Yeah. That would have been, <laughs> yeah. been really talented. That would have been a great skill to have, yeah. yeah. So you so you picked up guitar when you were 15. I mean, yes. how'd you go from learning like three or four chords to being as good as you are now, right? Just only because when when I was younger, everybody played guitar. Yeah, when yeah. Like when you're Korean, you go to a church, yeah, yeah. everybody fucking played yeah, yeah, guitar, yeah. you know? But from playing like the few Christian chords to learning how to understand and- I was play. actually uh, uh, a worship leader back of, then. Of course yeah. you were. <laughs> yeah. And that was the other angle, you know? Like when you're a worship leader, you're trying like, I just had a conversation with some friends. I just came back from Seattle and like uh -huh. Washington area. And I met a group of people, like uh, there were a couple of church people too. And the stories everyone was sharing is so international. Everybody had the same exact story about learning an instrument, playing the guitar to pick up girls at church or like the church cam, like you purposely sit next to the girl you like. So like Dude, when you stand up, you can hold their hands. I've, I've always said this a hundred percent. And every time <laughs> I have some fucking artist come on this podcast and I ask them, okay, hey, so why did you pick up dancing or blah? They go, okay, when I first saw them, I'm like, shut the fuck up. What was the real reason? And it's be always honest. to pick up a fucking girl. You That's what it is. That's yeah. what it always is. That's yeah. why I picked the guitar. That's why yeah. I started singing was only because I wanted women to talk to me. And that's it. <laughs> and then the art itself kind of like brings you of into course. the Yeah, the, then you, then, then the it shedding, kind of, it the loses its novelty. And yeah, then all yeah. of a sudden you, you know, yeah. you get really into it. But my first instrument was actually piano. Like at oh. eight years old and, you know, Asian parents, they're like, oh, here's a piano. Mm -hmm. Here's a classical piano teacher. Just go at it. Hated it. Like I did it for two, three years. And at some point I was so bored by it that I just quit. And it took me three years to like, re-pick up a different instrument mm. yeah that's crazy so so you go from picking up guitar mm -hmm. and obviously there's like this okay so oh, for the, people who don't know you're you're not from the states i'm not from the states. <laughs> you're from uh you you were born and raised in panama central america yes that's fucking crazy man yeah because i i only I actually know only maybe a, a couple of people who are asian who grew up in uh, central america mm. uh specifically like brazil mm. uh there's like a huge korean community out there which I have no fucking idea why. And Japanese. Yeah, yeah which yeah, I, yeah. I don't understand where the where, how that immigration happened there. I'm not sure about Brazil, mm -hmm. but for Panama, it was um, twofold. The first one was the, how do you call that? The train? Like the, uh, they were building a train so they had to get cheap labor from China. Oh, okay. And the second one was the canal. I don't know if you've heard of the Panama Canal. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's where uh, Panama kind of connects North America with South America. And mm -hmm. we're right in between. We have this canal that like levels up the waters from both oceans. Mm -hmm. And they need cheap labor as well. So that's how we had an influx of Chinese people. Oh, yeah. okay, okay. So in, I, I don't know the exact percentage of people, but there's probably one out of 25 people is Chinese probably in Panama. Really? Yeah. What the fuck? It's that big of like a community? My, uh, yeah, it's because Panama is small too. Panama only has like, four or five million people. Mm -hmm. And the population of Chinese people is probably like 200,000, 300,000. So it's like about uh, either seven to 10% of uh, the population is Chinese. Wow, it's that small? Yeah. I might be butchering up the numbers. But <laughs> so my- I'd be kind of like, yeah, fuck you, there's a lot more than that. <laughs> but my high, like my high school classroom, we were, we only had like 10 Asian, like, no, sorry, 10 non-Asian people. Like I graduated with a full batch of Chinese people. If you see really? my graduation photos, yeah. What in the fuck? My yeah. perception of like Panama is way different from how you're describing. Yeah, yeah. It. I mean, there's a. It's Panama is called the melting pot of uh, Latin America, and we had 
like Colombian people, uh, we have Venezuelan people, we have everything, right? But Chinese people is very predominant out there. What yeah. in the fucking world? Yeah. So okay, so so what was it like growing up for you there then? So it wasn't. Mm. So, so you saw a lot of people who look like you out there. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And the the funny thing is that out here, when I speak Spanish mm -hmm. to like everyone, like especially Mexican ladies or whatever, mm -hmm. they are very surprised by it, right? But growing or, or even knowing, because I can speak Chinese too, right? Everybody's yeah. like very surprised at the fact that I'm, uh, I can speak multiple languages. But for me, I was kind of put in the situation where I grew up, like at home, I had to speak Chinese. Um, the country forced me to speak Spanish. Mm -hmm. And then my high school or my school, because I went to the same school throughout my whole um, youth, uh, it was a British school. So they taught all the classes in English. So everything was kind of forced upon me. So I didn't actively learn a language. So it's not as impressive as people uh, like make it to be. Mm. Does that make sense? Because yeah, it's just like an everyday life. Everybody's everyday life, yeah. yeah. So when you tell someone, hey, like, uh, well, you don't tell someone. When people find out, find out that you can speak multiple languages or wow so imp impressive like you had mm -hmm. to go like daily practice all these languages i mean specifically in this country right yeah, yeah. because we're we're very singular here yeah, yeah most most people in this country only speak one language which yeah. is american english yeah. right everything else like i mean we're taught secondary languages or tertiary languages in high school, in high school or whatever yeah, yeah. but nobody really keeps it we only learn the basics our second language in my high school was spanish actually so the country forced me to speak Spanish, but my uh, class as a second language was Spanish, which was, it's super um, interesting and weird at the same time. Yeah. But um, yeah, that's just, just, I was forced upon the three languages like uh, that's so since crazy. I was young. Yeah. So that's it's not an impressive thing. I'm very blessed mm -hmm. and I'm glad that I was put into a situation where I had to know all three languages to live in the like my um upbringing mm -hmm. so now it's an advantage to my career or just like my daily life but it's not something that i had to grind for basically. i mean that shit works for you really well here though specifically yeah, yeah, los angeles yeah, right yeah. like learning how to speak spanish here is is so useful and i i just i'm inclined toward learning languages too like maybe it's because of that like i really mm -hmm. like japanese portuguese even korean like mm -hmm. i just uh on my free time i like to just go over words and learn vocabulary from different languages. Is, is the Spanish in Panama different from, from here? Uh, so here the most uh, spoken Spanish is the Mexican one, mm -hmm. which is like, they have a specific like, uh, el lato and you know, like that yeah. type of vibe. Mm -hmm. But Spanish in Panama is very plain. Mm -hmm. So if you don't really go to like the countryside or like the um, uh, outskirts of Panama, the language is actually very very plain like it's the most uh no accent type of spanish that you can find it's just everyone can understand it basically there's no strong accents or anything about it Hello, my friends. This podcast is brought to you by I 
IP Vanish. For those of you who don't know, IP Vanish is a VPN or virtual private network that helps you safely browse the internet. Simply put, if you are on your computer doing just about anything and you don't have a VPN by IP Vanish, are you nuts? Being online is fun, but your data is everywhere and having it encrypted is a must. I'm not just saying that you have to get IP Vanish because your online security is super important for browsing and keeping your personal data and information encrypted. I'm saying it because you have to do it. Here's everything you get with IP Vanish, anonymous IP address. This means your personal IP address can't be tracked by anyone on the web. Circumvent any online censorship. Get protection when using public Wi-Fi so basically nobody can snoop on your data or see what you're doing online. So go to ipvanish.com slash brain claim your 65% savings. They have plans starting at just $3.49 a month or $27.99 a year. This is the time to sign up with our discount and their current promotional offerings. You can get a VPN for 65% off their usual offer. Offering. IP Vanish is the best of the best, even rated 4.7 out of 5 on Trustpilot, and that's with more than 6,000 reviews. Show these guys some love. Remember, it's ipvanish.com slash brain to get the deal and start protecting yourself online today. Oh. You can make it like strong mm. acts that you can find the specific words that, let's say, a different state or province uses mm -hmm. to like uh, accentuate different words. But if you speak plain Panamanian, uh, any... Spanish-speaking country will understand. Oh, so you guys are kind of like the prototype. So yeah, <laughs> I guess the prototype would be Spain. Yeah, yeah. But yeah. you know, uh, Panama kind of has a very plain Spanish for some reason. The the uh, the Spanish like I, I met somebody from Spain, but their Spanish they had like a lisp or something. Yeah, yeah. So they go, for example, hola, cómo estás? Yeah, like that's the the Spain uh, yeah. Spanish, but Panamanian would be like hola, cómo estás? Yeah, like it's very uh, I don't even know how to say like very. It kind of reminds me of like. Um, I guess like a Taiwanese Mandarin, right? So like, yeah, may yeah, maybe. Yeah, it's yeah. very like when I hear Taiwanese Mandarin, I could hear different words. It's very clean. Yeah, you know yeah. I mean, versus when you hear the you know the one from the mainland. It's yeah, like, yeah, it's, yeah. It's very and even within mainland China, every province have their own intricacies and in how they speak their own Mandarin. Yeah, yeah, like yeah. Like the yeah. north from the south, and like yeah, every place has like their different dialects and way to. Oh yeah, hundred percent. Yeah. So for you, so when when did you move? Here and then, what made you move here in the first place? Just because you know, I, I mean, for a lot of people out there, I think when people come from a small town, usually people stay in their small towns. Yes, like it's it's yeah. a very scary. I mean, first of all, I mean, you you just said that the population of Panama was what four, four or five million, four or five people. million people, and you go from four or five million to a whole fucking like country. Yeah, area. yeah. California itself uh, is probably well, bigger well, than Panama. Well, four or five million, I think. LA is bigger than that. Yeah, <laughs> I think. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> you know, the city of LA is bigger than that. It's uh, crazy. Four or five million is when I left. So yeah. in eight years, there probably have been like more people, like yeah, maybe yeah. six million now. Yeah. Uh, what made me move out here was I've always wanted to study abroad, right? Even when I was in uh, ninth grade, 10th grade, 11th grade, like my dream has always been to move out of Panama and explore the world yeah. because I'm an internet baby, right? Like mm -hmm. I just grew up with a computer, stuck at home, playing my guitar, playing video games. Like that was me. I was not uh, a very social person person per se, like I would go out and stuff, but I spend most of my time at home in the computer and looking at all the interactions worldwide made me really wanna see the world outside, right? And I explored many options, right? Like uh, when I was in 11th grade, like second to last year before graduating, I went to London to see some schools. Um, my dad recommended some schools in China, in Taiwan. I really, I personally wanted to go to Japan to study. Oh, yeah, but okay. my mom was like, no, 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 too many earthquakes and natural disasters. You're not going there. Yeah. I'm like, fine. Um, Which was a good look because there was a huge, <laughs> in between that time, there was a huge fucking tsunami <laughs> yeah. earthquake. So, uh, your, so mo I, your mom was right. Just she you. was right. <laughs> um, but I still love Japan. I yeah. really want to go to Japan someday. And I landed on LA. So... Before I came to LA, I, I worked at KPMG. I'm not sure if you mm -hmm. know. So between my graduating year and my year in LA, I had like a gap year, right? You know how yeah. everybody takes like a gap year between high school and university, right? Mm -hmm. uh, and I took a gap year. And for me, my gap year was first, I did an accounting job. I hated it. I did it for of three months. Of course. <laughs> I did it for three months. Why the fuck would you go and do accounting, man? I, I was put into it because... Uh, how my high school worked is that the last three years, they give you a emphasis, right? Like they give you a very specialized curriculum. You can choose between being like the science guys, like biology, physics, chemistry. Mm. You can choose the business route, which is the one I took, which is accounting, economics, 
and like business classes and there's a third route the art one like you learn art you learn music mm-hmm. and stuff like that and asian parents i went Told through you to go the, the safe business route, yeah. route and once you graduate like the top few students get a chance to intern at the top accounting firms in panama mm-hmm. or worldwide there's like four big accounting firms like kpmg uh ernest and young deloitte and stuff like that right and i got the chance to enter at kpmg i got offered a job did it for a couple months hated it like that's what made me realize i'm not suited for the corporate life right yeah so right after that i joined a modeling agency it's it's weird my it's very weird hold on I, hold the fuck up. Like, <laughs> the fuck do you mean you joined a fucking <laughs> modeling agency how fucking random it's very random Wait, it's what, very what made random. you go into a model okay this is um, your, your timeline is all fucked up Hold on a second. graduation so, 18 okay. right I, yeah, yeah. <laughs> so graduated, you go okay i'm gonna be a fucking accountant which clearly wasn't gonna work out for yeah. you <laughs> like you um, know and then you go okay you know what fuck this i'm a model yeah. <laughs> you just go from that to that how the fuck did that happen <laughs> i think i think i have i had a couple of friends that were doing it right yeah yeah yeah. and there's different type of models there's the uh i don't know how you call it, the runway ones yeah, like yeah, yeah in spanish it's called pasarela mm-hmm. and there's the the models that go to like conventions right and they give out flyers they're like standing at uh, different boots and stuff like that and i'm like why not like let's get a a, a part-time job like doing modeling gigs right mm-hmm Funny enough, I never landed a modeling gig, but I did the photo shoot and everything to get like the portfolio. <laughs> okay. But through the modeling agency, um, by the way, the modeling agency was Wilhelmina. I don't know if you've heard of it. Mm-hmm. Wilhelmina, mm-hmm. but the Panama franchise. The head of the modeling agency uh, wanted to make a band, like a boy band. Like, uh, 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 if you can Google it, by the way, like we were uh, kind of known throughout the lands of panama you were in a fucking boy band what the fuck is going on right now dude <laughs> and it was organized by the modeling agency head right and he just picked, <laughs> okay hold on he put- like <laughs> <laughs> so you went to go you went to go be a fucking model right yeah. you go and you take their pictures they go listen this is not gonna work out but <laughs> it's a very interesting year yeah <laughs> you're go. gonna get more surprise in the they're, bit they're like hold on a second you're not you're not a model dude but we had this little boy band that i want you to be a part of yeah. did they know that you could play the guitar yes they did they did how the fucking yeah. random yeah and they they really went through their portfolio of models and picked out people that knew instruments right they found a drummer somehow they found a couple singers so i was a back uh backup vo- uh how do you call it? background vocals like, yeah like second vocals or whatever yeah. but i was a lead guitarist right so mm-hmm. they wanted everyone to resemble um, uh resemble the beatles so the head of the modeling agency was a fan of the 50s, 60s, and 70s music, right? So he wanted a cover boy band that did Beatles, Elvis Presley, like all this like retro music. So the band was called Rets, like based on retro music, right? So he picked a bunch of models that played instruments. He put it together and all of our shows were for rich white people in Panama. Yeah. So they paid really well. They treated us really well. We had like uh makeup artists and hairstylists and we had like writers and everything so that was my first taste of what uh a successful music career could look like right yeah and that's when i fell in love with the attention and stuff like that Uh, i was in the band for probably six seven months and i thought there was a ceiling you know like panama is such a small country like i don't want to be doing this boy band thing forever like um i really love music i want to take it somewhere else and that's when i um tried to look into schools music schools right and the easiest music school to get into was one here in la and that's the one i applied for i got accepted and i decided to move my whole life to la like after getting accepted what the fuck yeah. that's crazy so six to seven months playing of this boy this band bo- thing this yeah. boy band yeah and you're wearing magazine covers and everything like if you google it real quick like you can oh, find i it. gotta see fucking photos <laughs> i gotta see performances and this is all in you guys are all singing in spanish by the way no in english so we would sing like twist and shout and like all those like uh old school songs uh, i want to hold your hand and stuff like beatles song and we wear suits in every single performance. oh they really wanted you to be like the beatles yes, that's crazy yes 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 and like they wanted a specific look it's the it's a head of a modeling agency this was his this was probably his childhood dream right a hundred percent this was his childhood dream, and he forced it across yeah, yeah. <laughs> and we were we we're all like it's paying well mm-hmm. like there's an audience and we're still doing music you know and that yeah. was our modeling gig slash uh 
cover boy band thing, right? Nowadays they even do choreography and stuff, mm -hmm. but me as the first generation, we didn't do like yeah, yeah, choreography yeah. or anything. Like mm -hmm. we were just playing straight up covers, like maybe like uh, changing it up a little bit. And yeah, if you Google them nowadays, they dance and everything. I'm Wait, like, so, shit. Oh, oh, the, so the boy band, you left. I left first. I was I, I was probably the first one to leave the boy band. Okay. Yeah. And then uh, did they? Is it just so? Did they have the same band, but they just flip people? Everybody start leaving because the first generation of Red Red is the band's name with a Z at the end. Uh, the first generation we were all more serious musicians, right? Not that the current ones are not serious musicians, right? But we wanted different things. Like we played rock, we played fusion music, we played Latin. Uh, salsa and whatever so everybody wanted to explore um different music worlds right mm -hmm. and same with me i didn't want to be stuck doing cover boy band songs for the rest of my life right so i realized it first i left and slowly everybody also left and they had to replace the members one by one right and what was their original method they went through the models list and like they looked mm -hmm. at it and they got to a point where I think they realized that the band thing didn't work, like the music band thing didn't work. So I think the, I haven't checked them in a while, but the most current lineup is all really handsome looking, like young guys that Is it like the, 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 the K-pop model type of thing, right? Where Without the full on like yeah, yeah, dancing yeah. and stuff. And the music is still very chill compared to like all the EDM stuff. Okay, okay, okay. Yeah, so it's not like the K-pop model, but it's still like the boy band model mm. where they have like uh, a bunch of, pretty handsome boys like doing choreography while singing songs that girls love yeah, yeah. So how did how did it feel for you when you started doing music because obviously you went the accounting route the modeling route then the music route number one did it feel right and number two like did you enjoy all the attention like what was the what was the feelings i've i've never regretted anything i've done yeah. in my career except like in la a couple of things but uh back then i think everything led me to here right yeah so i'm very grateful for every single experience and I'm kind of omitting, like, uh, now that you mentioned the K-pop thing, I also did K-pop competitions in Panama. Of course. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> like, this is, okay. What the fuck? Okay, you got to explain to people what the fuck a K-pop competition yeah, is. Yeah. So. That's crazy. First of all, like, this is what I talk about when I say how weird it is and how how influential Korean pop music is. Yes. Right? Yes. Because when I was, when I was younger in uh, high school and stuff, right? I liked Korean pop music, but I never shared that with people mm. if I get my ass beat. Mm -hmm. <laughs> you know what I mean? Like you you share with people that you like K-pop music with a bunch of dudes that look yeah. like women. Oh, you, even, you, even like when I was young, like you wouldn't share this. Yeah, you, would, you right? wouldn't share it, right? But I had a couple of like close friends where uh -huh. like, oh, like here are the Wonder Girls. Like, and they're like, what are the Wonder Girls? Yeah. But it's like your best friends, right? Like, oh, check this. This is the Wonder Girls. And then slowly you turn them into like, oh, like I like this member too. Yeah, I like that member I too. I mean, you could only imagine, right? Because you and I were like seven years apart, mm -hmm. right? So from that seven being seven years apart, like watching men wear makeup, mm. it's not something you would get your fucking ass. But yeah, especially yeah. where I grew up, right? Yeah, like yeah. you wear makeup, people would call you like a faggot, a loser. You know, this, these are these are the terms they used back in the day. Not that yeah, I used. Yeah. They call you like you know gay, whatever, and they beat your ass. They make fun of you. They do everything you can. So now it's like when I when I see the identity of what a male can be wearing mm -hmm. makeup and doing all this other stuff. Very androgynous. Yeah, it's very androgynous now. And people are just kind of like, yeah, that's, that, that's cool. So when I see that reach over to like, you know, South America, right? Which from what I've heard from people, it's very like machismo. Mm. <laughs> I can only imagine. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> You probably have to hide that, you yeah. know?
This podcast is brought to you by Raycon, my friends. If you know me, you know that I only listen to my audio, such as my podcast with Raycon earbuds. Whether you are jogging, whether you are cooking, whether you just need a lightweight wireless earbud to do your daily tasks, Raycon has the answer for you. Whenever I'm cooking in the kitchen for hours, I don't need nothing else besides my knife skills and my Raycons to get me through standing on my feet all day cooking in the kitchen on top of that when i kickbox when i'm hitting the bag i definitely always use my raycon earbuds yes my friends we don't play here at raycon they're comfortable they're super lightweight and they're not bulky so you can walk around and do your thing all super light and ethereal if if mike tyson said i like to be super ethereal with my earbuds mike tyson here talking about the raycon earbuds i've never punched somebody in the mouth so hard and still had earbuds stick in my ear like these raycon earbuds it's amazing it's ethereal i love it so listen up Mike is telling you guys right now that Raycon's offering 15% off all their products for my listeners. And here's what you got to do to get it. Go to buyraycon.com slash brain. There you'll get 15% off your entire Raycon order. And it's such a good deal. You want to grab a pair and a spare. That's 15% off at buyraycon.com slash brain. That's buyraycon.com slash brain. But here's the thing. Um, it just depends on what crowds you're hanging mm. out with. Because, of course, the machismo thing is, like, very predominant, especially mm-hmm. in Latin American countries. But young people, they just follow trends. And if you just hang out with the people that are following the same trend, then you'll never face uh, those well, You just got to find the right group. You just have to find the right group, right? Okay. But I was talking about how the boy band gave me my first taste of attention. Mm-hmm. But the real um, taste of stardom was through K-pop competitions, actually. So uh, I did my first ever k-pop competition when i was 18 like during that gap year and i did a cover of i don't know if you've like big bang right like the oh the, shit the yeah, boy yeah. Band. and i used their most popular song back then it was like haru haru like day okay, by yeah. day and i was super nervous i'm like what the heck am i doing like i'm gonna sing a korean song in front of a bunch of uh people i don't know right uh but i wore my little suit like you know a little mm-hmm. suit and back then the v-neck shirts were popular and I had my Justin Bieber emo cut going on too, right? So that was popular within the K-pop world. And the competition was dance covers and a couple of singing people. I was the only person to play it with a guitar and sing like a cover. And I did it uh, slowly throughout the progression of the cover. People realized what song it was and they got louder and louder. And they just like mm-hmm. start cheering the song and just like singing along. 800 K-pop fans in a Latin American country, right? 500 to 800. I forgot the actual number. And once I was done, I was like, wow, like people can interact with someone on the stage at this level, even though it's a, just a random uh, Korean song, right? I really want more of this. I really wanted the tension of people cheering and just like singing along to whatever I'm doing on stage. And luckily enough, I won the K-pop competition right after I got like a flock of like people coming, mostly girls. They want to like take a picture and like they were just like chasing me around. I'm like this feels nice Mm -hmm. and then my best friends they were like oh yeah no more pictures blah 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 Mm -hmm. you know like at 18 years old like you love the tension your friends are like helping you and everything yeah yeah yeah. and then i walk back to the car and there were still people chasing i'm like wow this is amazing let's do this some other day right but i just i'm really loving this attention i go back home i wake up the next day panamanian k-pop fans made me a fan club like I woke up and there was a Facebook Ruben One fan club. I'm like, wow, what the heck is this? How random! It yeah. was super random, but it was enough to like spark that um, that drive, uh, that like drive, you- and that hunger and thirst. I think yeah. it's thirst, and it fed into my narcissism and my pride and everything that an artist needs. And that was enough to motivate me to continue pursuing music for the rest of my life. And that's very important too, yeah. right? And I, and I always talk to people about this. Is like, and you kind of hit the nail on the head. Yeah. When people ask what's what's important to become like a performing artist, right? There is a lot of like narcissism and ego. Yeah. Like you you have to actually have this. Yeah. And that was like one of the hardest things for me, right? It's because I didn't have much of that. Yeah. And yeah. so when when people ask you, there's there's a big difference when I see myself and other artists, right? And they I look at artists and the reason why they're so successful is because they do enjoy the spotlight. Yeah. And I'm not saying this in a negative way. Like you have to enjoy the intention. You have to, because yeah. that is going to be a huge part of your life. I think the hardest struggle for me was like, I never liked attention. I just did what I did mm-hmm. and it, it led to something else. Yeah, right. Yeah. 
And I, for some reason in my ignorance, I always thought that I could just do what I wanted to do and have nobody notice me. Yeah. But that doesn't work that way. Like you can't make a living off that. Yeah. Here's how stupid I was. I was like, I'm going to be like one of the biggest stand-up comics, but I want to still live in my hometown of Sacramento. Mm. How the fuck is that going to work out? Yeah. It doesn't work that way. How are you going to sell shows with 10 people in it? Well, exactly. <laughs> it's, it's not going to work out that way. Yeah. So I've always had this weird thing where it's just like, okay. I'm becoming progressively more and more known doing mm -hmm. this stuff, but I didn't want people to know me, which mm. didn't make any fucking yeah, sense, yeah, yeah. you know? So, and the people that are the most successful on the space are people who enjoy and thrive off of other people's energy and attention. Mm -hmm. um, like for IE, for an example, like there's the Logan Pauls and the Jake Pauls. Mm -hmm. There's a reason why they do really well on the space, right? It's not because of sheer talent. It's not because they offer anything very unique. Mm -hmm. It's because they know and they thrive off of people's attention. And this is what their model is based off of, right? Yeah. And if you want to be a great artist, you know, I'm not not great artist. If you want to be an artist like in entertainment, there there has to be a certain level of wanting to be in the spotlight. Yeah, yeah. If not, it's not going to work out yeah. for you. You know, because it's hard to deal with. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And I always say the people that can do art without craving the attention are the true artists. Like per se, because they can do it just for the sake of art, for or sure. Like pushing the limits of the of the genre or like whatever category they're doing, right? And I ha I crave a little bit the pushing the boundaries of like the instrument or like the art, but I feel like my thirst is more towards um, connecting with people, right? Having a connection. Um, yeah, that's the part of entertainment. Yeah, you know that's what I mean? the, like yeah. You're, you're an entertainer. Yeah, too. I'm an entertainer more than the boundary pusher artist, yeah, yeah, right? Yeah. And you have to realize what type you are, right? You cannot be in between because once you're in between, you're gonna, you love too much your art, you get too hurt when people don't like it. Mm -hmm. Or at the same time, you make art that you don't like, but people love it and you hate yourself for making art you don't love, but people love. 100%. And so it's really hard to be a in between. Like, ah, I wanna be entertainer, but also I wanna push the limits. It's hard to be there. Choose your lane and know what path you want to take as yeah. an artist or it's, it's a performer. The, it's the yeah. best way because there's there's no other way, right? Yeah. There's, you you have to figure out what you're going to be. Yeah, yeah. There's, I know, there's somebody I know right now, like this dude creates stuff only because he knows that it's going to get him money and mm -hmm. that's where he lives. Yeah, yeah. But when we have side conversations about what he does, he fucking hates it. Every mm. day he hates it. He goes, I've spent most of my life trying to make money, do all this other stuff. And now all this is all I know. Yeah. And then he looks at what I have where I'm not as rich as he is. But he goes, I wish I would have done what you did. Like mm -hmm. you have long lasting friendships, connections. You're happy with everything that you put out. Mm -hmm. It's like, well, you got to pick and choose your battles. Yeah. Like, if you want to make shitty fucking content and make yeah. money, that's OK. Like just but you don't complain about it. Like you chose it. And there, there is a small percentage of people that can do what they love and also make the money part. Yeah. But that's rare. Like it's very I rare. I do think it's yeah. very rare. Yeah, yeah it's, it's very it's rare. super fucking rare. Yeah, you yeah. know what I mean? And it's, it's, it's a lot harder. I think mm -hmm. it depends on what, what you can sleep with. Right. Yeah. Like I've, I chose to do podcasts. I did food or whatever. This is not in the realm of like making the most money possible. It's yeah. just something that I very, very much enjoy. Do the things you enjoy. And yes. that's what keeps me going. That's yeah. the only reason I could do this for fucking 12 years is yeah, because sure. I did what I enjoyed. You know, I, I don't have any regrets. Like I have like, okay, you could have done this and you could have been a lot bigger. Mm -hmm. well, who the fuck cares though? I wouldn't have been happy. Yeah. If happiness is your end goal, you just got to figure out what that fucking lane is. Do you have aspirations to be bigger though? No, this is, this is as... To be honest, you like the platform growing is is just the platform growing. Mm -hmm. I had a I had a conversation with a buddy of mine, and this dude was trying so hard to reach a million subscribers on YouTube, mm -hmm. and he's been on YouTube for a very fucking long time. Mm -hmm. And when he hit YouTube, like this dude started crying. He hit that million. He started crying. Right? He was like, "Oh my god, I finally hit a million. It felt like he achieved his life goal." I think I know who. Yeah. <laughs> right. And but then when he asked me, he goes, "Hey, like, do, it's like you remember when you hit a million? I go, "No, yeah. I don't remember that." I once once my I shit you fucking not when, once I hit three hundred thousand, uh, it didn't fucking matter. Yeah, 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 I was like, oh, I can do this, yeah. and that's all that fucking mattered. So his perspective of what you know these these life goals and these tickers, like I've already achieved more than I thought I could. Mm -hmm. People have to understand, like I grew up with absolutely nothing, not nothing. I had a good family, I had all this stuff, but in terms of like monetary wealth and everything else, and like I told you. Being famous was never uh, an objective of mine. Mm -hmm. It was just to create stuff that I really fucking enjoyed. My being the best stand-up comic wasn't because I wanted people to watch me do what I do. It's because I wanted to make people laugh. The objective was very different. So whether I became, so everything that I have now is is a bonus. So you don't really hear me complain about my life ever. Mm. I never complain about my life. Mm -hmm. You know why? It's because I had an objective. My my life goal was to be married, 
have kids and have a white picket fence house. And that was the height of my goals. Well, I've surpassed that times a million. Mm -hmm. So everything else is just a bonus. A bonus, a plus. Yeah, yeah Everything yeah. is a bonus and a plus right now. Mm -hmm. Even having you on this platform right now, but I'm not doing it. I'm doing it just because I want, I saw your videos and I'm like, oh, I want people to know who he is. So thank you. Like, so the objective of my life is very different, right? And because of that, when people ask, oh, what's your next biggest step? And my manager gets frustrated too. He goes, what's your next biggest move? I'm like, mm -hmm. I don't fucking know. Mm -hmm. I don't know what the next biggest move is. Like, I didn't expect to go have a Netflix show, sell this food show. I didn't expect any of this stuff. Yeah. I just did what I did and it opened doors for me. So I, like, I don't suggest people to live this lifestyle because <laughs> it's actually very chaotic. Mm -hmm. It's, 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 it's kind of stressful because, because I don't have set goals like I used to when I was younger mm -hmm. and I'm just living and I'm surviving. Like it's 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 very stressful <laughs> you know like if you don't have a specific goal and you're not working towards things i don't suggest people who start out in the space to do that mm. i just i've developed enough uh projects and i've developed uh, and i put enough time into it where i can do that now mm -hmm. so if if you ask me like what's my next big goals i don't really fucking know <laughs> so it's, it's okay yeah I, I think it's more important that you're in a happy place yeah. than searching for the next big thing yeah and this is what i tell a lot of people even myself i need to wake myself up every time is uh the fact that people don't enjoy when they reach certain milestones right mm -hmm. they reach one milestone and they're right away they're looking for the next thing to do yeah. and they don't actually rejoice in the current situation they're blessed with right like oh i achieved this now let me enjoy it let's go out with some people and enjoy it together celebrate the achievement and actually live your life a little bit and then look for the next thing like if you're always searching for that next thing you're gonna burn yourself out really really fast 100 percent. because he like you people even ask like yo where's your million dollar where's your million subscriber plaque yeah, I, yeah. I think i threw it away when i moved like, <laughs> I, don't, I don't know where it's at i i completely lost it yeah, yeah. i like the silver one too i lost that too like yeah, yeah. these these physical or even like these number these tickers they don't give a value to my yeah. life they don't show value at all yeah, yeah the proof is in the pudding it's already yeah. there like i don't need the fucking plaque and if i yeah. want that plaque i'll go to trophy shop to make yeah. it for me again like and even uh, i'm gonna get a little businessy yeah like there's so many people with millions of followers and subscribers that are living dirt poor you know yeah like the number one determine your lifestyle the number is literally just a number yeah like knowing how to uh, monetize uh, whatever following you have is 10 times more important than getting a huge number and just like show it off, right? The flex culture in LA specifically is so predominant that is kind of toxic at the same time. Like find your niche, enjoy that community and grow together with that community is 10 times more important than yeah. like, trying to push for that 1 million, 1 million mark. What's the difference between 999 point nine 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 versus <laughs> one million there's no difference it's just a number that shows up on the screen yeah that's that's yeah. the hard part too for a lot of young creators they they don't understand the concept of like it's not about the million that you have in the followers it's about yeah. the connection that you have with the few that follow you yeah, yeah because there's a lot of people out there that'll die for you right? yeah, yeah but then if you're still reaching out to this community that number one they wouldn't care about any new projects that come out they don't mm -hmm. share your stuff they don't buy your merch mm -hmm. like this these people are the ones that matter the most. And mm -hmm. when you focused on the million instead of the hardcore thousands, it, it doesn't really fucking yeah, matter, yeah, yeah. you know? Um, and, and that's what a lot of people get caught up in. And then for you too, you, you're you going from a very small city to one of the most like craziest cities in the United States, right? There's a few metropolitan cities that are considered quite hectic, mm -hmm. San Francisco, Los Angeles, and New York, mm -hmm. right? I mean, how was that adjustment for you moving to Los Angeles from this small town because Los Angeles, even for me, I came from Sacramento, which is a smaller town. Yeah. Los Angeles was a very, very difficult experience for me to kind of acclimate to. Yeah, yeah. Know? I mean, till this day, LA is still a love and hate relationship. Yeah. Um, the traffic. And <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I mean, outside of those things, just like yeah. finding real connections is really hard. Yeah. Luckily enough, after eight years, I do have a very close circle of tight-knit friends. Mm -hmm. uh, I'm really, really... Uh, I really like to put importance on who I call a friend because especially in LA at the beginning, everybody was a friend, right? Cause that's how it happens. in Small towns. You have a mini talk and then he's your friend and you guys are friends for 10 years and it's all cool. You go to in the same LA, school together, yeah. everything. Yeah. In LA having a, a good chat for 30 minutes, people will start calling you a friend, but it's really hard to determine if that's a true friendship or not. It takes a couple of years to really know what's this relationship about. Right. And not only that, um, compared to Panama, LA is already a very fast-paced place, even though compared to New York, it's still very yeah. slow. 
Uh, so getting used to everybody grinding every time, like every time you're asking somebody, the next big thing, uh, everybody's looking for that next big job or I'm doing this, I'm doing that. They're trying to tell everyone what they're doing and they're trying to network and stuff like that. It happens in Panama, right? But not at such an aggressive rate. Mm -hmm. Here, as soon as I land it, everybody's trying to know uh, what you do. How can I help you? How can you help me? And how can we do something together to Where do you live? further do you occur? Drive? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, so that took me a little time, but I kind of expected it already, right? I knew that I was going to have to do the network culture and stuff like that. And luckily for me, uh, growing up, I did have a lot of chances to travel, right? I've been to China many times. I've been to the States uh, multiple times as well. Before actually moving my whole life to LA, I've been to LA probably like two, three times because LA is actually the place where you have to transit to go to China. Oh, okay, okay. Yeah, so I would stay in LA for two, three days. So I... I I knew what the city looked like. I just didn't know what the culture of the city was like, right? Mm -hmm. So that probably took me a year, two years to get used to. And we can go back to the regrets thing, right? Because I was from a small town, my first two years in LA actually didn't like pursue like my passion as, uh, as, as much as possible, right? I was enjoying the party lifestyle. I was like, oh, like LA, there's a party every single day. Every There's something to do every single night. So I was um, entangled with that uh, lifestyle, I guess. So my first two years were kind of a blur. Like I was just trying to go to as many parties as I could, meet as many people as I could, and just live the life that Panama didn't offer. But of course, like Panama also had that thing I just didn't like um it's different it's like, different you it's have a different. new identity here yeah, but, in your life yeah but then after those two years it was out of my system mm -hmm. and that's when i start realizing the people that were actually making it in the industry right like what type of grind they had to do or like uh what's the level of artistry i need to aim for and that's when i went back to the like my bedroom and just start shedding like shedding mm -hmm. the instrument like shedding the art and just trying to improve myself every single day it took me two years to eliminate all those uh, uh party lust i guess i can call it like the I lifestyle mean, the, lust. The, i mean there's yeah. no regrets in that too because you don't you don't know what you miss yeah. out on until you do it exactly so like, and it took me that to realize that uh i needed to hustle and grind right yeah and i i guess it's not a regret but more like i could have used that time more wisely but la is la like i love it and i hate it i guess yeah yeah yeah, yeah. i mean it's a it's it's weird, right? Because like I, you know, I've I've mentioned this on the podcast before of when people come to this city, mm -hmm. there's you know, I, I read these tweets or like comments or that, or even from people who are outside from the city because I've lived here what eleven years, twelve mm -hmm. years now or whatever. Um, people go, oh, you know, everybody here, they're they're only here to network and blah mm. blah blah blah. It's like, well, so are you. <laughs> you know, yeah. it's like, so what did you expect? You know, people are going to give and take the same way that you do. Mm -hmm. You know, it's it's about understanding what the relationship's about. You know, you know, coming from a very small town, you know, obviously my town was probably similar to yours, but just in different countries, right? Mm -hmm. It's just, yeah, when you know the same people growing up. I had the same friends since I was in elementary school and high school. Same. So, <laughs> you know, yeah. you keep people for life. Yeah. Over here, it's a little different. One of the biggest things that I hated was like when people would call me their brother or their friend. And I'm like, I don't fucking know you like mm -hmm. that. Don't call me your brother or your friend. Yeah. But it's so easy here. Right. They go, oh, it's like, oh, yeah, he's the homie. I'm not your fucker. I don't know you like that, bro. <laughs> like I met you fucking once, <laughs> you know, yeah. and they throw these words out a lot. And yeah. a lot of the times that we call this like fucking on the first date, yeah. a lot of people here fuck on their first date uh. and they say it so fucking easy. Yeah. And people get disappointed when people that they just met stab them in the back. It's mm. like, well, you just met them. You yeah, didn't yeah. fucking know them. Yeah. It's actually your fault because you started calling them brother, friend and best friend. Yeah. The people who do it the most in the city girls yeah they love that shit oh. bestie yeah. yo oh my god i fuck with this bitch so hard like she's so <laughs> she's just like and then two weeks later she's fucking her uh, her, her fucking boyfriend yeah, and they're yeah, like, yeah. how the fuck did that happen is because you don't fucking know them you yeah. fucked on the first date mm -hmm. you don't know these people yet mm -hmm. and the the hardest part for people to do is because the city is so exciting and things move so fast yes is learning how to separate friends homies and acquaintances mm -hmm. right it's okay to say that that person is an acquaintance it doesn't mean that you dislike them or hate them it just means you don't fucking know them yes i have a lot of acquaintances i have a good amount of homies but i have a very small amount of friends and that's okay mm -hmm. like you have to be okay with that people look at relationships and like these deep connections as if, as if you're supposed to have them in abundance you don't look at look at probably your parents my parents all these older people they only hang out with a few people and my <laughs> friends don't even have i don't think they even have friends i They're think my mom has one friend 
Yeah, exactly. Because you know I mean? she's a bitch. Yeah. <laughs> she has like one fucking friend. That's really about yeah. it. Yeah, and it's especially hard for that generation. Like my parents' generation was such a hustle and grind environment. Mm -hmm. They could care less about like uh, having friends. Everything is just an acquaintance. So I can somehow survive this country, basically. Yeah. yeah. I mean, you came here. And uh, so when you came here, you already knew how to speak English and everything. Yes, yes, yes. So my parents didn't speak Spanish when they went to Panama. So that's, yeah. like those are my true superheroes and idols I look up to, like my parents. Those yeah. are like, I don't even know how they did it, but they somehow managed to uh, build their own legacy in a foreign country. And yeah, I look up to that. I get scared and pressured because I might never amount to the same level of success as them. But it's at the same time very inspiring to look at them and how they built their lives. Yeah. So yeah. how did you go from, you know, the parting life and then you decide to grind out to, you know, people knowing your music here, aside from your boy band stuff? Like, how did the people <laughs> get to know your music here? Oh, yeah. So after I did the K-pop stuff, right, I, yeah. I kind of wanted to detach myself a little bit from that because I got into the, I'm a musician. Like, yeah, I'm yeah, an yeah. artist, you know. Uh, so eventually the fan club died and stuff like that. I came to L.A., Party. I, I was partying, but I was also going to music college at the same time, of course, right? So, still a student, yeah. Um, my Asian side didn't allow me to fully, fully party, so I was still trying to like excel at school. But at nights, just like go have fun and mm -hmm. stuff. But at the two years mark, that's when I um, realized how talented all the people around me were. I'm like, oh, I've had access to all this. Um, uh, what's the right word? Um. People in the same industry as you, the colleagues. Yeah. Like yeah. I had so much access to all these talented colleagues. Why don't I like uh, start um, absorbing all the knowledge I can, right? And that's when I started grinding the instrument. I got okay. I got proficient. Like I could survive uh, the LA music scene because it gets a bit of a. It's like a dick measuring contest. Like every time you go jam with like session musicians and stuff like that. Uh, but I got to a certain level where I could I could hang with people, right? Uh, I start going to jam sessions, meeting all the industry people. I start doing the session stuff as well. Like I would do sessions and touring with um, like famous artists, like just uh, behind the scenes, not me on the spotlight. And I thought that was going to be the rest of my career. Mm -hmm. I thought I had completely detached myself from the spotlight. And I was more of like the background people, like helping uh, the artists become a bigger product. Uh, I did that for two more years. So two years of partying, two years of doing the session thing. And then I realized I actually won the spotlight. Like yeah. I, I started uh, realizing that uh, my pride and my narcissism thing is bigger than I thought it was. So I started craving the spotlight again. Um, so I started doing my own stuff. I started releasing um, fun little Instagram videos where instead of just jamming my college practice exercises, I would put some more thought. Like I would set the camera properly, the lights and stuff like that. Come up with a small, uh, I think back then it was 15 seconds, 15 mm -hmm. seconds Instagram, 15 second Instagram composition, right? Mm -hmm. It was probably the stupidest thing ever on the guitar, but I put some effort into the video and people liked it. So my first well-produced video uh, received good attention. I got my first 1,000 followers. This was in like 2015 or 2014. Yeah, And to me, that was... That was it, right? I'm like, wow, I have a thousand followers that liked uh, this video. And that was enough for me to continue putting out like little compositions, right? Guitar compositions or singing or rapping and stuff. And I just did that consistently throughout the rest of my college life. And that slowly snowballed into uh, my current following. And through it, I've had multiple opportunities here and there. So I just take them when it comes like magazine, like interviews or... Uh, different like this like for this right you discovered me because i put out a video mm -hmm. on uh the internet and you liked it and then you reached out and then we just talked a bit and then this happened right so i've had a lot of those small opportunities here and there that kind of bundle into my current career yeah. now yeah so for you when, you when you when you so like you said you were busy all throughout may this is like stuff that you're doing uh individually as shows or are you part of a band ensemble like what what, what are you booked for um uh, so recently I decided that everything I do musically has to be kind of um, legacy. It has to be like a legacy move or something that mm -hmm. is like me, right? But May, I don't know what happened to May, but I just started accepting all these like uh, partnerships like with different brands. And like I started doing a bunch of um, 
ads, I guess that's how mm-hmm. you call it, like brand deals, like mm-hmm. for social media and my YouTube and stuff like that. Uh, I did a festival, like pre-recorded festival, like a friend of mine, she's a singer and she really needed a, a guitarist. So I did that as well. We did like a two, three day rehearsal and then like a festival recording that will come out a couple months later. Mm-hmm. I did a couple performances. Uh, me, myself, it was API month, right? Yeah. Asian Pacific Islander Heritage Month. Mm-hmm. So I got a lot of offers related to that. Like there was uh, like an award show, like an online award show. They needed a performance. So I did a performance for them. Um, Instagram had the like, uh, Facebook or Instagram there together. They had like an event where they were celebrating uh, Asian American people. So they asked me to talk and I was part of their mm-hmm. uh, panel. And like a lot of things just snowballed into May. Like I thought May was gonna be all about me writing songs for my upcoming album, mm-hmm. but no, May was all about brand deals and just like talking at events, playing at events, and doing like live show performances and stuff like that. Yeah. Do you yeah. have um, do you have any artists that you really want to work with, like in terms of like playing for or uh, playing with? Playing for. So I I decided that I don't want to play for anyone anymore because I already did like a couple years of that already. Uh, but if I had the chance to. I would do it. I would happily do it for Haley Williams, Paramore. I don't know. Oh, yeah, 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 yeah. So that, that would be like one of the. That's random. Yeah, that's very random. <laughs> that's very fucking random. <laughs> <laughs> so like, why, why Paramore? <laughs> no, because she's such an amazing performer. Yeah. I, w- I would not mind at all, like being behind the scenes, just playing guitar for such an uh, amazing performer, I guess. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah. But to personally work with, I have a million people I would like gladly work with. Yeah, 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 yeah. yeah. Cause like I, I got, I'll work with you. Do you want to release a song? <laughs> <laughs> I'm too busy doing bullshit right now. <laughs> like music is such a hard thing, right? Like I've I've never really enjoyed music to where I wanted to like pursue it. It was always yeah. just a side hobby, right? Mm-hmm. Like guitar was something I tried to pick up because I wanted to sing, but usually somebody else played for mm-hmm. me because I couldn't pick it up. It was so yeah. fucking hard. Like I just I couldn't do both. Yeah, <laughs> it's yeah, yeah. so damn difficult. Like even like playing the guitar. Like I've because I've never really tried to learn the guitar per se mm-hmm. i never understood the instrument yeah. right because we were we were like praise leaders praise mm-hmm. leaders only knew their very specific chords we knew what to play we had the shitty ass fucking drummer yeah. shitty ass list, and we just played <laughs> praise music you know yeah so in terms of like understanding the instrument it was just something that was like far out of my reach yeah. but when i see people play the guitar right and i just i'm like i definitely don't know the instrument <laughs> yeah know? like the instrument is a lot more complicated than it actually looks yeah because anybody can pick it up and play their few chords mm-hmm. that's not a problem they could do the same like rhythm strum that everybody else does but learning how to play it yeah. is something that blew my mind like, even like somebody like aj Raphael, like when he like uh sheet reads oh he's amazing i'm like what the yeah. fuck how do you do that yeah, you he's, know, he's like oh well today like i just found this uh, sheet music that my you know, uncle had before, and I'm just going to play it right now. I'm like, this is the first time you ever saw it. You sheet read it. Like, I don't get that shit. Yeah, I guess it's like improv. Like, yeah. like when you do comedy and you improv mm-hmm. and you like riff with other comedians, it's the same skill. Mm. Like you have to practice it and eventually it becomes part of your skill set and it just comes naturally. Yeah, I yeah. mean, it's, it's it, yeah, like I when I see, like I have a, a buddy named his is Ken Belcher, right? He, mm-hmm. I think he went to USC for, for music or some shit, right? And he used to fight on. I'm also a USC grad. <laughs> That's awesome, dude. Yeah. And see, like for him, like he, uh, he used to do. I was like, hey, I want to do this cover, mm-hmm. and he was like, oh, cool, let me listen to it. And he goes, got it. And then 20 minutes later, he records it and he sends it out to me. I'm like, yeah, yeah, hey, yeah. what the fuck, guy? Yeah. How the fuck did you do that shit? You know, for, <laughs> like I don't, I don't understand it. Like I, yeah. I don't understand how somebody can listen to something and be like, oh, is this chord? Is this progression? And is this, this, is that? Yeah. You know, it's so weird. Uh, hear me out. So there's this example I really love to bring up. Mm -hmm. Music is like a language, right? Everybody always say music is a language. Mm -hmm. But the problem with um, how people are taught music, they don't teach music as a language. What they do is that when you're eight years old, they sit you down and they tell you, you are a beginner. You are level one. So here, learn your scales and like learn, this is do, re, mi, fa, so, la, ti, do, whatever, right? If you really wanted to teach music as a language, right? Little kids that are three years old, um, they hear how adults are speaking and they're learning how to speak the language. That's why at five years old, uh, a five-year-old kid can speak English like fluently, right? If you really taught music that way, like just putting them in a situation where they have to like survive. If you put a three-year-old with a guitar right now and we're two professionals jamming, he'll have to survive and adapt. He'll like learn what we're doing, okay? And then he'll slowly start doing it without knowing the alphabet or like the words or whatever, right? And eventually, after a year of just looking at professionals doing their thing, he will pick it up too. 
That's how little kids learn language. Mm. You put a three-year-old here, hear us speak for a whole year, he'll start speaking English fluently as well, right? Mm. So it's not about the 10,000 hours of practicing the instrument. It's more about how you actually uh, absorb all that information, right? Um, English, when you learn your first language, you didn't learn the letters first, right? You didn't learn grammar yeah, first. Yeah, yeah. You only heard what adults were saying and you were copying. Oh, like uh, my mom said hi and he said hi. So that must be a greeting, right? If you teach a kid music that way, like I do a lick, he does a lick. Oh, that must mean communicating. And he'll learn that that's communicating instead of knowing, oh, that's a do, re, mi, that's a fa, so, whatever, whatever, right? Um, and that's what I'm saying. You have to teach kids music as a language, not music as a curriculum, right? Mm. And that's the biggest pitfall of uh, why I hated piano, for example, at eight years old, right? Because they taught me everything as grammar or vocabulary. Here are your exercises. Here's your scales. Here's your whatever, whatever. That's the fastest way to turn somebody like off from it. Yeah, because I learned piano, I don't remember shit. Yeah, exactly. But if you were taught as a language, then you would still be jamming and like playing with people just by ear, you know, because you speak music as a language. See, that's like one of my biggest regrets too because I, yeah. I like one of my favorite uh specifically when it came to like vocally who i really like was yeah. brian mcknight yeah but i liked him so much because i love his live performances mm -hmm. he, that motherfucker is so good yeah <laughs> you know what i mean he speaks he speaks a music language fluently yeah like, he's like, proficient at it how the fuck because i've seen him in live concert yeah. like three times already mm -hmm. right i'm literally the youngest person there because mm -hmm. everybody's like 40 50 years old <laughs> And they're all black women. It's just me. It's <laughs> <laughs> just me there. You know, just fucking. No, I know more music than any of these bitches. I'm like, get yeah. the fuck out of my way, bitches. You know? And so, but when I see him, when he plays his instrument, it's like a language. It's like mm -hmm. he's just talking. He's just talking. Right? Yeah. Some Somebody will play some shit. Yeah. And then all of a sudden, he just starts playing along. With, I'm like, yeah. how the fuck did that happen? Yeah. yeah and, <laughs> you know? And that's the same thing about improv, right? Yeah. Improv is a skill that you practice, right? If you improv a lot, then you're good at it. Music is the same. If you improvise a lot, then you become good at improvising. Mm -hmm. Exactly the same. Like English and music can be compared with the same analogies and uh, same similes and stuff like that. Oh, that's crazy. Yeah. So if you were to teach somebody how to play the guitar, how would you start it then? I'm, you know. So of course you need uh, like, like the basic muscles, like mm -hmm. uh, make sure their fingers don't bleed out in the first week or something. Like oh, make it's sure. Oh, bleed. <laughs> Shit. <laughs> I have no, my fingers are so soft right now. <laughs> yeah. So, so give them some muscle memory first, of mm -hmm. course. And step two is just listening to a shit ton of music. Mm. Just give them every single genre possible. Have them absorb what other musicians are doing and make them understand the sounds first, right? Before they can play a... Mm -da 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 -da, like, mm. they know the sound first. They can sing... Mm -da 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 -da, mm -hmm. And then they learn on the instrument, right? They learn the context or when you use that. And... 
why are we using it is not as important. It's more as uh, when should I re reply with this phrase? Mm. You get what I mean? Because mm -hmm. it's not about understanding why understanding is understanding, right? It's more about when to use the word understanding. Yeah, that yeah, makes yeah, sense yeah, at yeah. all. Yeah, 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 yeah. I see what you're saying. Um, so I would just sit the kid down, ask a couple of friends to come jam and just like have him like try to understand what we're doing, right? Uh, especially if he's a very young kid, like let's say two to five years old, right? All we're doing during those three years, I won't explain anything. Just have him sit with a guitar, watch us play. Mm. Like just watch us jam and just like chilling as musicians, like communicating with improvisation and stuff like that. And eventually, uh, almost... 100% sure he'll pick up most of it. And then he'll start doing it at the same level as, uh, as the professionals when he's five years old. That's crazy. Like I'm I'm almost 100% sure. Because if you compare it to a language like English, if you put a five years, uh, a three year old here and he just listens to a podcast like for two years, you bet he's going to speak the English fluently, right? It's like that dude from um, that one Korean band. He learned how to speak English through watching Friends. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Just by osmosis, right? Just mm -hmm. like absorbing it. And let's put a more uh, practical example, right? Why do you see some kids at three years old speaking like an adult? It's because their parents didn't treat them as little kids. Uh, most parents go like, oh, how, how are you? Like they just mm -hmm. go like the little cutesy talk, whatever. But w the only thing you're doing with doing cutesy talk to your kid is that they're gonna start speaking cutesy, right? They're mm -hmm. gonna speak like a baby. But the kids that are three years old that speak fluently their language is because their parents, they talk to them like an adult since mm -hmm. they were born. Yeah, they're like, yeah, yeah. Uh, hey, Tom, like, do you wanna eat? And then the kid will go like, yes, I wanna eat because they've been hearing how the parents communicate for as long as he's been born. That's crazy. Yeah. Yeah, man, like I, 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 I don't know if it made sense. No, like that, my does, that does make sense. That, that does make sense, man. It's yeah. just, you know, I mean, you definitely do have an ability and a skill that a lot of people don't have. Yeah, yeah. You know, it's 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 talent. Mm. You know, there's talent and obviously like hard work is there too. And a little bit of luck and a little bit of grace, everything kind of comes together. Definitely. You know, and I guess like for you, you know, before we sign off, like what what's like some advice that you can give to somebody who wants to go into the same route? Because I've also have other fans who you know, like you watched my videos, yeah. but they never turned out as well as you did. Yeah, yeah. You know, um, this is like from my perspective of things. Sometimes yeah. people, their confidence precedes their skill. Yeah, yeah, <laughs> you yeah. know, and that's 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 the stuff that I get scared about mm -hmm, for a lot mm -hmm. of kids. Right? They go, yeah. "Oh, I I've seen you know Ruben do it, so I can do it." And they yeah. go out and they they kind of. I think the difference between you and them is that you did the due diligence first, mm -hmm. and then the the idea of becoming famous and yeah. you know being known for your stuff comes after because the due the, 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 the due, due diligence. diligence was done first yeah, yeah, yeah right so i guess like for you if somebody says that hey i want to be a reuben uh -huh. like what what would you suggest that they do they want to be a reuben like in terms of like music and where their career wants to go because uh -huh. there are already people like that now yeah, yeah, yeah you know so first of all figure out financial stability right mm -hmm. your career needs to make sense before you actually pursue it right mm -hmm. you cannot uh be worried about paying rent next month and do music it's just any job whatsoever right? you cannot be worried about paying rent so make sure everything you're doing is making sense financially first because that's gonna take a big stress off of it just from the get-go right like you can focus on your art when you don't have to focus about where you're gonna sleep next yeah, month right yeah 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 uh make sure all the numbers make sense right okay um, why I need 10,000 followers. It's because 10,000 followers will give me um, 40,000 streams in this month if I release a song. And those 40,000 streams equals X amount of money and I can pay rent. Mm. And once you can pay rent, focus on everything else, everything else that you love, right? Like whether it's due diligence, playing your instrument, or whether you're trying to network with people. And due diligence can be explained in many ways. I feel like I haven't done enough. I've just been... Like I just said, like a little bit of luck, a little bit of grace. Uh, but always know that success is when opportunity meets preparation. Mm -hmm. Like without the both things, you don't get success, right? You need to be prepared at all times to just do your skill, right? Like at any moment, if somebody asks you, show me your skill, you need to be ready. If you're not ready, then you miss your opportunity and you don't get that, uh, like that door that they just offered you, right? And you just lost your chance completely. I was lucky enough that I tried my best to always be prepared no matter what situation I was put in. Um, and when the opportunity actually came, I just answered to the door and just uh, made sure I gave a good impression. And that put me in places that 
other people that were not prepared didn't get a chance to be at, right? And last but not least, something that gets overseen a lot in the music industry is how you portray yourself, you know? A lot of people are into the flex culture or just like being rude in general, especially with musicians. Musicians can get very rude and stuff. But I feel like for me, being more on the quiet side and like, um, I call it fake humble because at the end of the day, I'm a narcissist. Yeah. Uh, but like not showing off as like, oh yeah, I did this. I did that. Like yesterday I made $10,000 and blah, 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 blah. Right. Not showing that type of personality actually attracts more people to like actually find, find out what I do. Right. And by starting conversation and getting people interested in who I am, like, oh, how can he be at this level and still be nice, right? That will make people come to you and ask you. And when they ask you, that's a more real connection than actively networking, right? Yeah. And I don't know, it's it's a bunch of things that have to come together, but preparation meets opportunity and just be a nice person. Yeah, I mean, for sure, there's this idea of, like I told the story too, where I remember when I was in San Diego, there's a kid who... He kind of stood up and then he had this whole, I mean, it was, it was, it was this conversation about like how Asian parents don't support what you want to do. Mm -hmm. Right. And, you know, we hear this a lot and I've, I understand and I, and I understand both sides, right? Cause as I get older, I start to empathize more specifically with our parents, you know, what they have to go through and the kind of what they want to see us do. They don't want us to see a struggle. And yeah. you kind of already brought that to where you think about, okay, well, I have to make sure I'm financially stable. So I don't have to struggle with my art, mm -hmm. which is very sound. And I don't think a lot of people say that, you know, people think that, oh, I'm going to be the starving artist. Trust me. When you're the starving artist, it's hard. You're like, starving. It, you're, you're literally starving. You know, like <laughs> it, it fucking sucks. It's hard. It's hard yeah. to be creative. You know, some people can really work through that. Mm -hmm. But, you know, it's, it's like that idea of when people talk about um, generational wealth in this country. A lot of mm -hmm. that generational wealth happens because there was a generation before them that set them up for success. Mm -hmm. So that's what you're doing for yourself when you kind of set yourself up financially so you could work on your art. Yes. If, if I were to make a simple comparison. But there was a kid in San Diego when I was doing the show where he was like, oh, I hate the fact that my parents won't let me do what I want. I actually don't even want to be in college right now. And I was like, mm -hmm. okay, cool. So what do you want to do? He's like, I want to be a musician. I was like, oh, all right, cool. So what do you do? He's like, he goes, oh, I sing and I play guitar. I was like, cool, man. Well, guess what? It's like 400, 500 people here. I have a guitar right now. Yeah. You could perform something for us. Yeah. And he goes, ah, oh, I don't want to. I was like, you're full of shit. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> you know, you don't have the skill or the confidence to come up here and perform. Yeah, yeah. It's like, that's bullshit, you know? And that was his opportunity. And <laughs> He, did, he wasn't prepared, I guess. <laughs> and that could have been his first 500 followers. That could yeah. have kickstarted his career, you know? Yeah, a lot of people and, are full of shit. Yeah, you know? they, 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 they think it's so easy for somebody to sit down and say that, oh, you're, you're so lucky, you did all this other stuff. But it's like, if you were given the same opportunity, you wouldn't have been able to capitalize yeah, yeah. on it. And that's the biggest difference. Yeah. You know, I think a lot of people like to, they like to be the backseat driver. They love to give instructions to people, but when you put them at the wheel, they don't know what the fuck yeah, to do. Yeah. And it's, it's hard in this yeah. generation. It's easy on Twitter for people to go ahead and shit on somebody, to have yeah. opinions about stuff. But when it comes to what they have to do, they're silent. Yeah. It's like, that's why I said too, I, I put it out recently that I was like, most people, when they send me stuff that they're gonna fuck me up, I'm a fucking, you'll never say it to my face. 99.9% mm. .9 of people will not say that to my face mm. because it's, you have an avatar where there's no face to it. Yeah. It's easy for you to DM somebody because you're probably in your room, in your basement and nobody gives a fuck about you. Mm -hmm. And you're hoping that when I read that it ruins my day, Yeah. but it doesn't ruin my day. You know, it used to when I was younger. Mm -hmm. Now it's just like entertainment. It's like, yeah. oh shit, like I'm really fucked with this person so bad. <laughs> <laughs> so mad, you know? Yeah. You know, my friends know too. They always see me giggling. It's like, what are you giggling about? And I show them the message. Uh, and like, doesn't that make you mad? It's like, yeah. no, it's just it's just funny that they're expecting a certain reaction out of me. And it makes me laugh that their day is ruined because of something I did. It's yeah. like, yo, what the <laughs> fuck? I'm like, why are you so mad, bro? Like, yeah. it's the weirdest thing. You know, I, you know, yeah. So opportunity and that the idea of success is it's very congruent and kind yeah. of comes together. And yes, like luck makes a little bit. Of course, of that there's equation, always a little bit of luck, you know. But that's not the whole picture. That's not the whole picture. And if you really, really crave for it, you'll find a way to find that opportunity. Like it's not like you have to wait for it to fall from heaven. Like if you really crave for it, your preparation will seek that opportunity and you'll find it. Yeah, I love that yeah. too. And I had talked about this on this podcast and there's still people who don't understand it. Yeah. They go, well, you're saying you're not lucky at all. Listen here, you fucking dumb fuck. 
I keep, I keep telling you, it's not. I'm not saying that luck has nothing to do with it. Yeah, I'm saying yeah. it's a part of the bigger picture. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Everybody has these lucky opportunities. Yeah, yeah. It's about who capitalizes on it. Yeah. And who made the smarter moves? It's just, it's just so more complicated than just to and, say that somebody's lucky. And here's a a very ex, uh, recent example, right? Somebody told me they really want music placements, right? They want their music to do like sync licensing and getting plays on shows like that, right? And they're like, but I'm not getting the opportunities. I'm like, yo, literally go to Netflix right now. Go to the credits of whatever show you like. Look for the music supervisor. Stock the crap out of that name. <laughs> and it may happen, you know? Like, you yeah. never know. Just find them on LinkedIn or something. Email them and tell them, hey, what music do you need? I got a catalog. Mm -hmm. It's as simple as that. You finding the opportunity, you know? Yeah. Like, and it may not happen that way, but I've heard so many people that actually did do it that way, right? Just, like, uh, find the people that will make your career happen. Stock the crap out of them. Email them, reach out, and you might be surprised at the outcome of it. Yeah, you never know. You like, never know. Like, the last podcast, uh, yeah. I talked about wanting to talk to this dude, China Mac. And yeah. like, I was like, I DM'd him. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> you know, that's what I did. And <laughs> yeah. he was here, right? Yeah. Like, yeah, then it's as simple as just having the boss to reach out. If you yeah. really crave it, you'll find a way to achieve it. Yeah. 100%. Well, guys, yeah. uh, that wraps up this podcast. I hope you guys enjoyed that. Um, before this podcast ends, though, uh, I would love for you to play some music and okay. I want to kind of put it throughout the podcast so people kind of get a feel of who you are. Okay. But uh, where can they find you, man? Uh, you can find me everywhere at Ruben Juan, R-U-B-E-N-W-A-N. -E Spotify, Instagram, YouTube, whatever. It, every, everything is Ruben Juan. Perfect. So you guys yeah. can go ahead and support and check him out. He's actually one of my favorite like musicians out there right now, specifically the way he creates content and always support people that you really, really fuck with and enjoy. Just because you know about them doesn't mean that everybody else will. So uh, remember Genius Plans every uh, Thursdays and Sundays, and we'll see you all next time. Take care. Peace. Bye-bye.